Hi everyone, uh, Hassan here from the Ref6 podcast. Uh, I am joined by John. Yep, hi, I'm John. Uh, still a level four from Sussex. Brilliant. Uh, Rob? Yeah, hi, um, I'm a level five uh, ref from Shropshire. Hopefully going to get my level four promotion this year and I'm up at Liverpool at uni, which uh, if you can still call it uni. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And we're joined by Dan as well. Yep, hi, I'm level four from Sussex as well. Brilliant. Um, so, as we always do, we're going to start with a, a bit of news from, from the footballing world. Uh, so, John, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, so um, something came out the other day from the Times uh, newspaper saying that the Premier League referees will back moves to re revert to the old handball law um, with sort of the match officials being unhappy the way... Obviously, we've spoken about handball before and it's coming back again. And apparently the Premier League referees, according to sort of like different sources are unhappy with the way it's been applied in the Premier League and generally sort of fans. So the Premier League will back going backwards, basically. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the head of UEFA has also sent a, a, a letter into FIFA about the handball law as well and seeing if there's an opportunity to change it. So, look, I think the way they've implemented it has been correct all season based on law. However, it seems like the law has made or is becoming... Pretty unpopular with, with with um, fans, Everyone. players, and referees. Yeah. I, I just want to touch on this with you guys all on the call. How has what you've seen in terms of handball in the elite level impacted your games? Like, have you had a lot more calls for handball? Do you think you've given handballs this year that you wouldn't have last year? Do you want to? Who wants to go ahead with that? Uh, I, I think for me, it's um, been a case of amateur players getting a lot more confused about what handball is going to be given for. So it's definitely just an appeal for for Definitely. everything, especially yeah. yeah, especially anywhere inside the attacking half. It's just straight away, bang, and they've seen on the TV, let's have handball. So I think it can be difficult sometimes to explain, yeah, that's, that's not handball because it's just it's his hand in front of his body rather than hand out to the side. So Yeah. And Dan, yeah, similar? Confusion. Yeah, I would agree. I think it's just kind of turned into a bit of a shout for handball for anything, really, just because I don't think any of the players really understand it, it seems, because of that confusion of understanding it. So they just mm -hmm. scream and shout and hope. Yeah, that's fair. And John, anything similar? Yeah, it's very similar, really. With lower league football, you find they appeal for everything, because, do you know what I mean, like, as bad as it sounds, like sometimes shout for something, you you think, oh, right, yeah, okay, there must be something there. So you're going to get a shout for everything, especially at handball anyway. Like, we get loads of shouts anyway, as soon as it touches their hand. But at our level, it's easier to explain, no, 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 no. Yeah, he was running, he was in a running motion, and they sort of accept that. Obviously, we don't have VAR, so we can't bring it back and mm -hmm. look at it. We just say, he was in a running motion, he brought <laughs> his hands in, and they genuinely accept it if you explain it like that. But if you just scream, no, it's not a handball, you've got to sort of tell them why in my yeah. uh, from what I've learned brilliant um in, in other news uh the Ukrainian female FIFA referee who officiates in the top flight in U Ukraine Katerina Monzol is to take charge of a Nations League game uh between San Marino and Gibraltar so again we, we've been trying to highlight um as much news as we can on the female side of refereeing we had um Stephanie Frappar do a men's UEFA game and now to see another female uh, take charge of a men's UEFA game is great too. Um, so that's another piece of news. Um, everyone probably would have seen uh, yesterday there was um, some interesting conversations that happened between the FA chairman, Greg Clark, and uh, the Department of Culture and Sport, I think, uh, DCMS, um, talking about certain issues within the footballing world. And unfortunately, or well, depending on your viewpoint, he made some very, um, you know, a string of remarks that a lot of people found offensive, a variety of different things, and, and ended up resigning at the end of the day. So uh, kind of from my perspective, a great, a great um, kind of justice being prevailed where, you know, someone said something very inappropriate and actually been made to kind of pay for that and has resigned. So um, hopefully the the next chairman will be uh, someone who, or chairwoman, maybe someone who can can move the 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 those types of thought processes in the FA a little bit forward. And I'm not saying it's rampant within the FA, but at least just from that one conversation, it wasn't the the 
didn't put the FA in the most in the best light. It didn't represent all the people that we know who work in the FA that are definitely a lot more diverse and inclusive of different um, people's backgrounds, etc. So, uh, straight, uh, you know, a, a big big news there that hit kind of Twitter and then went everywhere in terms of uh, the BBC and Sky, etc. So, um, and then next, John. Yeah, the final point of the news is that the Premier League. Again, uh, the Premier League seems to have a busy week this week. Um, they're going to reset the campaign led by the teams about allowing five substitutions to happen in the Premier League. So, obviously, the rule for that is um, they're allowed to make five subs, but in three instances. Yeah. So, three stoppages in play, so you can make five subs. So, it's still like three subs, but you can make more than one <clears throat> in there. Um, after, I think it's Pep Guardiola and Klopp especially have been hampered with injuries and they're saying that it's not... They've, obviously, they play Sunday, Wednesday, Saturday and it, apparently it's just getting a little bit too much for them. So yeah. they want sort of more subs. I, I, I think it's fascinating how this has been able to be brought back to a vote again, if it does. Um, I'm pretty convinced that it's going to go the same way as the previous two votes and the, the lower league clubs are going to... Um, going to vote them down again but you know it's it, it's an interesting one and I think to change it I, I halfway through a season doesn't make sense look they did change it halfway through a season last year but that was you know really different circumstances whereas now I think you know I think they've got to get used to rotating uh, players and, and, and that but again on this one I want to want to ask you guys what um what do you think about kind of the national league system adopting something like this because we don't you know, it is very much three three play, uh, three subs from five players on the bench. Um, but at grassroots, you know, they have a lot less resource, right? So is it something that, you know, you think clubs would want to be able to do? Or do you think it adds even more complexity to an already strained season? Um, I, think, I think the first thing to say on that would be the top level with Guardiola and Klopp, they seem to... Uh, the reason it will get probably voted down is they just want to bring on loads of attacking players at the end of the game to maybe break some teams down. Um, and I saw it's fast. I've just checked it now because I wasn't sure, but uh, they only made two and one subs in the City Liverpool game on Sunday, which was a bit of a strange time to uh, go and attack it in the media, wasn't it? But I think <laughs> as you go down lower leagues, I think football's been three substitutions in most competitions for a while. So. I think unless the schedule gets really hectic with teams playing Saturday, Tuesday uh, after this lockdown, I don't see any reason why they'd need more substitutions, to be honest. No, fair enough. Yeah. Similar thoughts from you guys? Yeah, I'd agree with Rob. Like, Unless they're kind of doing Saturday, Tuesday and then potentially Thursday and three games in a the week, then I think, yeah, fair play. Uh, you can look at having potentially more subs, but... If you're kind of just doing Saturday, Tuesday, realistically, everyone should be fit enough for that. Um, yeah. Especially kind of our point of view as referees as well. We've got to do it. So why can't a player do it? That's very true. <laughs> and John, you mentioned you mentioned around, uh, actually, they're, they're in a bit of a privileged position around the transfer window. Yeah, so it's different at the top level. With Obviously, they're set with a transfer window. They can only sign players. From in January, and they can only sign players between June and August, or whenever they change it every year. Um, whereas at the lower league levels, I find that they can sign players on a free almost whenever, as long as there's a deadline by the end of the week. So squads can change a lot. So I think at National League, they have to have a main squad, a squad of 25, I think it is. Um, but at Ishmael League, players can come out of their contracts and join another club. Uh, without too much of an issue throughout the season. Similar sort of county league football. Players leave their contracts, um, if they're, if, even if they are contracted to them, and move clubs willy-nilly. So like squad depth isn't so much of an issue because they know there's a vast range of players um, that they can just pick up on a free. Yeah. Um, so do they need the five subs in that game? Because they probably have realistically 30, 32 players that are on their books, ready and raring to go. So they have that ability to rotate at the lower level. So I feel like five subs at a lower level, especially it's senior football, is very redundant. Yeah, perfect. Cool. All right, well, that's the news. Um, a few weeks ago, we were chatting on, the, uh, on, on our podcast about 
the what we do when we talk to club assistants the pre-match the instructions we give so today we wanted to move on and focus on the pre-match conversation that we have as referees with our assistant referees and also from our point of view as assistant referees what we like to hear from the referees so um i i guess for those who are new to refereeing uh, maybe refereeing on their own on the park when you get up to the point where you're refereeing with two other officials who are qualified referees before the game there's some kind of uh ceremony that happens whereby you know you get to the ground on time you chat to each other and you have a discussion about what you expect from each official in the game um and that's effectively what we're calling a pre-match conversation right so john did you want to just um set out what kind of you like to do in in your pre-match um I think what we want to talk about here is, do you memorize it? Do you have notes? Uh, this is for everyone. Do you memorize it? Do you, ha do you ever have notes? Do you ever change it? Um, you know, what happens when you know the officials and not? So let's talk about all of these things. So John, do you want to go first? Yeah. So when I first started with having senior officials, so neutral assistants, I used to, because obviously we have to wear suits. Uh, I used to have a suit for refereeing and in that suit, in my little pocket, I had notes about how I'd break down the, the team talk because obviously I was new to it and needed to make sure I covered everything being a team bean at, I think I was <laughs> 18. So that was obviously really important for me. And then obviously five years later, I've picked it up and I've learned, learned it off by heart. But what I tend to do for me is I start at the goal line. So tell them what they're to at the goal line and then work my way back up the pitch until we get to the halfway line. And then I start talking about the managers. And the thing I leave with, uh, like end the conversation with, is mass confrontation because it's one of the things that's the biggest. And I deal with it slightly differently to probably how Dan does and how Rob does um, and probably how you do. So obviously that's the big key point for me. Um, I change it up. Um, so that's the last thing they remember on a mass con. Uh, it's mm -hmm. the last thing we go in for. It's the, probably the biggest thing to remember. Um, but if I'm with people that I know and trust, I won't keep it as big i'll be like i'll go over the key points you know the drill plenty of eye contact like goal kicks throwings offsides are all going to be yours uh we lead in the middle uh and then i'll go over mass confrontation again um and sort of what i expect from them still rather than just sort of like yeah you've worked with me before you know what you're doing get on with it like, at least we still go through the process perfect that's that's one of my pet peeves when i turn up as an assistant referee and the referee just says you know what you're doing let's go out and have a great time which is nice but actually like actually there are certain things that different referees like you say want differently and i think those are so important to be covered um rob talk us through what what you look for and what you do um yeah so the, the start of my pre-match will always focus around welcoming people to the team and getting eye contact um getting those soft signals um just to help each other really because i think Highlighted me, highlighted it for me in uh, January when I went to the Iber Cup in Brazil, and I found myself uh, officiating with people that couldn't speak English, which yeah. was quite a challenge. So I thought, well, a normal pre-match of going from goal line forward isn't really going to work here. So I think by making sure that we all knew each other, comfortable with each other before the game started, and um, sort of that team spirit, that helped to uh, get decisions right in the game, and it it just made eye contact real really important. So. Um, yeah, that that will always be the first point that I make, even when I'm working with people that speak in English, because, um, yeah, just just helping you get decisions correct. Um, and then I think I'll move forward, uh, as John was saying. Really, I'll make sure I've established a senior assistant. Um, they'll be writing at all times when I am, uh, and then the junior assistant will be um, eyes on the play in case something's happening when we've got our eyes down in the book. Um, and then. Third point I'd move on to would be assistant's main responsibility. So um, it's highlighting offsides in and out of play as their main area. But I think it's also I'd always make the, the point of have a look where I am on the pitch before you do anything, because I want to make sure that we're giving it as the most credible person. Um, and then offsides, it's just sort of delaying that flag until um, we're absolutely sure that they're offsides, that we don't look like Muppets. That's always the line that I leave it with. Um, yeah, and then I'll sort of work through smaller decisions in the game, goal kicks, corner kicks, moving forward of 
Uh, it's probably quite generic of what people do, but I think it's important to all be on the same page. And then again, similarly to John, I'll always leave it with the two big things in a game of football, I think, which are um, the key match decisions, saying that, again, it's have a look where I am on the pitch before you get involved in penalties, that sort of thing. Um, and then mass confrontation, just in case there's differences in how other referees do it. Brilliant. We're gonna we're gonna touch on some of the specific points around penalties and mass confrontation. Exactly what you say, because I'm sure they're gonna be different. So Dan, is that a similar kind of flow? How you go about it, or do you do anything? Different? Yeah, no, it's pretty much a similar flow from how I go about it. Kind of the start of the goal line, like John does, and then just work up the the field of play and the pitch. Um, to cover all the areas and then as long as you kind of start on that goal line then you're working your way up and in theory you shouldn't miss anything because you're doing that step ladder but obviously sometimes you do um, especially if you haven't got that, that little note card that, like John was saying about but, mm-hmm. but yeah that's generally how I kind of tend to cover mine um, I don't try and waffle it all out and go as long as possible um, just try and keep it short and sweet really but make sure you cover those points that you need to perfect so like time wise what what would you say is like a is it five minutes is it ten minutes when does it get too long what what are your suggestions I think if you're going over five minutes yeah it's, it's, it's starting long. to yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah everyone like, switch off yeah my attention span is not the greatest as I'm sure everyone on this podcast <laughs> already knows um <laughs> But, like, if it's going on for... Like, I've been in team talks where we've got to the ground, like, an hour and 45 minutes early, and for half an hour, I'm speaking about the game and what the referee wants out of me. And it's like, oh, my God. Like, after about 10 minutes, you're thinking, geez, this guy's still talking. Yeah. And, like, you know, you're not actually thinking about it anymore. And you, you're like, you've, he's lost. And I, that's what... we got to keep it within five, I think. See, this is the th- thing that you've just got across is... You know, you, you want to engage and you want to let the your assistants know exactly what you want from them, but you then don't want to get bored and you don't want them to think about you in a negative way yeah. because you're about to go into a game together. So, Rob, is that five minutes is about right for you too? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I've got a bit of a funny story about, well, what John's just said, actually. So uh, I know you had, you had Lee Probert on the, the podcast yeah. um, a few months ago, didn't you? Um, he did a thing at St. George's uh, with a, so it was like a series of classroom sessions and outdoor. Uh, and one of them was on um, pre-match instructions. So he got Andy Garrett and uh, Richard Mendlin, who's the other guy who runs Par 4 Sports. And they were sort of playing the role of um, uninterested assistants. So they'd be looking at the ground, they'd be on their phone, they'd be doing stuff. And it was uh, sort of a bit of role play to get used to dealing with those sorts of people, which is quite prominent in grassroots football, I find it. Uh, hopefully, the further further I that I progress, then avoid those sorts of people. But um, yeah, that was quite it was quite good to perform it in front of a group. So that's quite a good activity for people that are listening to practice if you need to. Mm-hmm. So yeah. at an RA meeting or something like that. That's a good good little topic yeah. for someone to take up. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I think so. Brilliant. Okay, so five minutes structure. Do you have notes, both of you, Dan and Rob? You or have you kind of memorised it now? No, I kind of just go from that step ladder from starting with the goal line and work my way up. Yeah. So I assume you're all doing it on the pitch as well. So everyone's got like a visual cue of what's going on. Depends how cold it is outside, really. <laughs> it's raining. <laughs> yeah, it's if it's raining. If it's raining it's However, I do have a thing. Apparently, there is a guy, um, there's a couple of guys that bring whiteboards. And then okay. they work on the whiteboard. So can you imagine turning up to a game with a whiteboard and going through it and being like, right, this is this, this is like, that is preparation at its finest. <laughs> that, yeah. I mean, look, the, the managers do it. So why aren't the referees? No, interesting. Yeah. It's a good backup if it is raining and, and, and hailing it down crazy. <laughs> um, okay. So there was a couple of things that you mentioned. So first is that I think is really important. It's just welcoming people to the team. Say, nice to meet you, learn a bit about them, you know, basically set you up for, for being a team, right? That's great. Picking your assistants in terms of who's senior and junior, giving them their roles specifically around that. Offsides. So uh, you mentioned offsides are obviously the assistant's main role, right? What are you yeah. saying around offsides? Are you literally just saying offsides are yours at all times? 
Yeah. Um, and literally the only thing I'm getting in, in, involved in is if you're wrong in law. That's like a very kind of parroted thing that I hear most referees say. Is that is there anything different to that? You're all nodding like, yeah. I say the only time I'll take it off them is from a penalty. Uh, yeah, that's they're very good. On the go- like they're on the goal line, um, like doing being my goal judge. And I tend to be in and around where the line is anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was the only time I'll take it off them because obviously they're going to be scrambling to get back if the guy's missed it um, or it's been saved. Luckily, that offside challenge may not happen that much, but that would be my. That's the only time I'll take an offside off him or her. It would be from a penalty kick. That's very interesting because that is a definitely a correct procedure. But I don't think I've. I may have heard one referee say that in my career. It's not very often that you hear. That attention to detail. Anything else on offsides, Dan? Rob? No, I think that's pretty much how I cover mine as well. Do you okay. boys work with buzzer flag? Please. Yeah. Y- you do, Dan. Rob? Yeah. Um, I've worked with buzzer flags with um, at step five and six when I've been on the line, but I don't own any for when I'm in the middle. So. so does your Dan and Rob? Does your pretty much differ because you have buzzer flags? Because I don't have buzzer flags, so I tell my assistants like. Keep the flag up for offside because the chances are I can miss you. Like I have that ability to miss you because I don't have a buzz. So does your do you ha- still say that, Dan? In yours, like, I'm uh, sure yeah, I, was, I still cover it that they keep it up even if I do miss it or the buzzer doesn't work. Yeah. Um, because at the end of the day, someone will shout. Um, and then even if we can play on the advantage from the offside and we've broken away and we can carry on, then happy days. Um, if we can't, then I've got to hold my hands up and take it back perfect cool and then the other pieces that you mentioned were around so the two major ones i think we can all agree on are penalties or uh, decisions around the penalty area and mass confrontation so let's go to penalties um dan i'm going to start with you i'm your assistant referee what you want me to do around penalties so i usually start with Either I'm 100% certain and I'm giving it. Um, and then even if the assistant thinks I'm wrong, um, just don't get involved because I'm 100% sure. Um, and then we talk about it inside. Um, mm-hmm. Or I'm either 100% certain it's not and telling the player to get up. Um, likewise, not for them to get involved. Um, otherwise, it just looks messy. Um, or the third option is I'm staring at them for some help. <laughs> um, so please do help me. Um, and then even if it's kind of, and then I kind of within that penalty bit, I also cover the free kicks uh, on the edge of the box. Mm-hmm. Um, just for, if I'm giving one and it's on the edge, um, just for that 100% clarification, I either ask them to take the two steps to the left or the right, whether it was in or out, um, mm-hmm. just to cover myself and make me 100% confident and like confirm my decision that it was either in or out. Not to put the flag up either, just move that sideways because, I'm the only one that's then going to pick that up um, unless there's another referee around in the yeah. ground. Um, but the majority of the time, the players don't pick that up or anyone watching. Yeah. I've heard a, a variant of that exact piece. So using your assistant to give you an indication whether the ball's inside or outside the box on a really close free kick. Um, some people have said exactly what you've said and some people have said if it's inside the box, run down to the corner flag. If it's outside the box, basically stay where you are. And that's another, that's slightly more exaggerated. Mm-hmm. Um, and it might get a little bit more attention, but at least then you, then you haven't got like, oh, <laughs> how, yeah. how far have they gone in or out? John, I feel like that, yeah, I feel like that eases your like control of the situation as well. I say almost the same as Dan, but say what you say, like if it's, in, if it's a penalty, run down to the corner flag, because then I know like it's inside the box and I can run straight to the spot then. And people will know straight away. Like, I've clocked him, so I know it's inside. I can close straight to the penalty spot. And it's sort of, everybody knows that I'm in control. Like, if I wander around and sort of, was it inside, was it outside to the assistant? And nobody really knows. Then it sort of can inflame the situation. Whereas if I run straight to the spot, then yeah. they know it's a penalty. If I run, if I stand on the edge of the corner, on the corner of the box and say, it's here, they know it's a free kick. Like, it's mm-hmm. diffused that situation straight away. Cool. Rob, anything different from yourself? No, that sounds very similar to what we've mentioned, I think. Uh, maybe highlighting, um, just delaying that flag whilst you wait for the, I'm 100% sure either way, 
um, just to make sure that you're not both 100% sure, but the opposite way around. Um, but yeah, no, I don't have too much to add to that. Brilliant. I, I think the only thing that I think is important, what the, um, and we haven't really touched on it, we've just touched on giving penalties. So maybe during the penalty ceremony, what do you talk about? Do you, do you ask them, what are you asking the assistant to do in the, once you've given a penalty, what are you asking them to, them to do? Rob, do you want to go first? Um, yeah, so predominantly watching whether the ball has gone over the line, so standing on the edge of the um, penalty area. Um, but also watching for the goalkeeper going off the line. I think this is always, always make the point of make sure that it's blatantly obvious to the extent that all of the players are appealing for it as well. Because I think as soon as you go looking for a decision where it's a couple of inches over the goal line, you're just probably making more trouble for yourself when, especially when the game's not televised. So, um, yeah, yeah I'd, I'd, I'd say watch the ball over the line. And if, if we're 100% sure <clears> that he's gone, Maybe if he's on the edge of the six-yard box or getting towards it when he saves it, then we'll go, OK, well, might need to retake this. But until that point, just stay out of it. Yeah, good. Any any other differences? I think just uh, from the flip side of that, obviously, as I've got buzzers, um, if they're unhappy with that, rather than sticking the flag up and kind of bringing the attention to themselves as well, just stand there and buzz. Um, and then we have that conversation afterwards to just not bring them themselves to the attention. And... Yeah, very good point. And if they are, or if if you are going to retake it, maybe get over to them as quick as possible because yeah. you know the players are going to go and follow them, right? So <laughs> yeah, something yeah. like that. So the one thing I've noticed that I add in uh, on here, and it's just because it's happened to me a few times, and I, I find your pre-match evolves once things happen to you because you're like oh i hope that doesn't happen again or i want to make sure that that kind of doesn't happen again is from penalties is remembering that obviously if the ball comes off the post and come back to the player and he scores a goal that it's an indirect free kick because he's effectively touched the ball twice and sometimes in the heat of the moment your mind can go because it's so rare that it happens that you just think it's it's okay so i've added that in is to my assistants please just be you know give me a, an indication should that happen. Luckily, it's, it's happened in games where, you know, I've been referee and I've, I've spotted it, but it's taken a, you know, a s couple of seconds longer than it probably should have. Um, or, you know, I've been an assistant in a game and I've had to kind of flag and then have the conversation because of, with the referee because it's, it's, it's so rare. Has that, uh, do, you, do you have any things in your pre-match that have evolved based on, you know, incidents that have happened in your games? Anything in particular? I do. Um, tight calls on the line. So uh -huh. the ball's gone over the line from a corner. And I never, ever covered this until, like, I mean, it never happened to me for, like, a year and a half. And then it happened to me twice in two games where the ball's gone over the line and everyone's like, ref, that's gone in. I'm like, I haven't got a clue. And my line is standing there like, yeah, nodding his head, like, it's gone in. I'm like, oh, God, so I've got to go over, see what's actually happened, right, it's a goal. So now I've said, like, put the flag up, tell me the ball's actually gone out of play because it's gone over the line, and then run to the halfway line, like, exaggerate that movement because then I know it's gone in. Yeah. Uh, that's what I've had to evolve my pretty much to say. Very interesting. Any any of you guys? No, I don't think so. Very, very, uh, no, and Rob's, Rob's not no, sure. I, I think mine's just probably more involved in like the depth that I cover certain things and mm -hmm. not necessarily picking up and adding new bits in, just the depth of how I cover certain things and then maybe not really as much depth as other things. Yeah, no, that's fair. I think we, we all focus when we start early on with like really focusing on goal kicks and talking about goal kicks for a while, you know, hey, you know, watch them at the six yard box, then go to the 18 or go, you know, or get on the offside line, which has slightly changed since the new goal kick law, right? Previously we'd tell people, you know, monitor this, you know, if the goalkeepers put it down in the six yard box from the 18 yard box, but now you're probably back there anyway, if they're playing it short. Um, and, and we're focused on these things that are, you know, goal kicks, throw ins and corner. We focus on, you know, the bits that aren't as important. And then we tr we kind of almost rush through the big the big important pieces, which are the fouls, misconduct, penalties, and that's gone. But um, yes, yeah, it's, it's super interesting that over time, I think you learn 
you know, quick ways to just get your point across on the, the things that are kind of a little bit more smaller. And then, um, and then you focus a lot longer on the bigger, the bigger, more important topics. Um, so Rob, do you want to talk us through mass confrontation and what you talk about there? Um, yeah. So I'll start off saying to the senior assistant, uh, I think this maybe is where it might differ referee to referee. I'll say in terms of the benches, if they're going to run on the pitch, then they're probably going to run on the pitch anyway. So let's just try and notice who started it with numbers, if it's substitutes or obviously if it's managers, we'll deal with it afterwards, but let them go on. Don't try and stop them. Uh, and then let's just try and form our big uh, triangles so that we've all got different viewing points, uh, making sure we're all keeping our eye on the play at all times. Uh, and then we're looking to try and between us, trying to remember um, who's been, who's the initial foul been committed by, um, who has then reacted to that, and then who's run from 50 yards across the pitch uh, to get involved because they're the obvious ones we can get the numbers of, whether it's the goalkeeper or a centre back or something like that. Um, and then, yeah, I, I'd normally just say I'll give it a few blasts on the whistle, but I'm not going to keep, not going to keep blowing it. Um, we'll just try and let it calm down itself. And then we'll have a chat, all three of us, and get it in order of red, yellow, ticking off if, if that's it. But that's probably unlikely. Um, and then I'll probably add in, if I can get a quick red card in to defuse the situation, then I'll go for that first. But if not, then we'll have the chat and do it in order of um, severity. We talked about uh, quick cards on another podcast. And I think if a quick red or quick yellow can help uh, reduce like diffuse a mass confrontation that is probably the the best points in time to give the the quick flash card as people call it um do you ever talk about the numbers of players right so how do you define a mass confrontation so some some referees will say you know up to three of each team or up to six people john do you do anything like that yeah i say if it's six or less i can probably deal with it it's i mean i can stand there blow my whistle make myself look big stick my chest out and deal with that anymore and I'm going to start asking you to creep in and if they all suddenly dart in. So basically I asked my assistants to monitor the speed of the players. If the players are sort of jogging in to pull each other away, then they can jog in. But if yeah. everyone's pinging in to this big circle, then I expect my assistants to react in the same way. Interesting. I've not heard that before. That's a really, really cool, cool idea. Measure that... Me You've got to mirror and mimic the speed of the players that are coming into that. Yeah, that's yeah, because really cool. there's no point if I have if there are a few guys who sort of like half running in to pull people away, and I've got two assistants speeding in. It could heighten it because it seems to be like, oh my god, they think something's worse than it is um, because they're like sprinting in. Whereas if they're sort of like wandering in, jogging in, then it, they're matching the tempo, so everyone seems to think that we've understood what's going on. Yeah. Brilliant. And then Dan, when you talk to the officials, when once it's all died down, is your process to talk to both of them at the same time, or do you go one 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 after the other? No, I tend to all come in together, um, okay. Because then the players don't know who's what's come from who, um, and okay. if we are, then obviously sending someone off or something like that, and they don't know who's seen what um, and who said what really. So if they're then going to have a swipe at someone, they've got to try and have a swipe at all three of them. Mm -hmm. And just make sure that you're in a position <clears throat> where you can see all of the players, right? So you yeah. want to be on the touchline, probably looking back over the players over to the benches, which is great. Um, very, very cool. And then is there, from a mass confrontation perspective, and this is probably a, a little bit outside of the pre-match conversation, but... Um, you, you mentioned the instigator, the retaliator, and the two people running um, to, to the mass con. Is it important, or do you find it important that you're looking to balance the number of cards you give per team on, on that type of situation, or is that an unwritten kind of thing, or is that just not something you do? You'd like to, in like the grand scheme of things, because if there's 22 players in there, I, it happened to me at a game. Like I had an eight, nine man brawl and I sent three of one team off and zero of the other because that's yeah. all I could see. So you'd like to, like, you go over and be like, has the away team got anything? And if they say no, then there's not a lot you can do. You'd like to level it up because they're all in there and if one team. They've all done one, something, right? You know, yeah. And you yeah. know they've all done something. But if you've not got the proof or you've not seen it, 
So yeah, you'd like to, but if if it doesn't happen, then you know, I mean, you just face it as it comes. Brilliant. Anything from Robin Down on that? No, I think it's making sure you kind of got everyone that created something that someone's seen out of the three of you. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, don't go making it up. Don't go yeah. guessing. Yeah, no, that's the worst if you're not, yeah, if you're not 100 percent sure, your systems aren't 100 percent sure, then you can't give it. No, perfect. I've and had, then, um, sorry, um, go on, Rob. I've had uh, referees in the past say to me, "One assistant take one team and one the other." That's I don't know I like what it. your thoughts thoughts are. I haven't. I don't say it personally, but uh, it is an interesting idea to maybe make sure that you do get one of both. That's how I do it. I ask one. So if the senior assistant is in front of the away team, I'll ask him to look at the home team. And then I'll ask the other one to look at the other one. Just because then I look at all of them. So I've got a general idea. They're very much focused on one team. So I can go, right, away team, who did what? And they can pick it out rather than... Because what you tend to happen, I know everyone looks at the same thing and no one looks outside of those players. So... I know that if I've got one person looking at one team, one person at another, they're generally going to pick up the people around as well that are causing me more, potentially more issues by winding players up or catching someone without me realising it. Yeah. I think that's a really good point as well. Because your, your, your view, as soon as you say, hey, look at the home team, your view comes a little bit backwards away from the incident and it, it, you know, you, you're getting a little bit more of a perspective in, so you, you're more likely to see things that you wouldn't if you're all just looking at the same incident. So that's great, brilliant. And then, how do you leave it? Like, how do you, how do you finish your team talk? And that will be off our finish to this podcast this week. But how do you, how do you kind of sum up the the pre-match? And uh, is there anything you say at the end? Just go out, and enjoy it, make sure everyone's looking at each other in good communication throughout the game but mostly just enjoy it we're all there to have a good time yeah similar with you guys same thing I think um, maybe asking if they've got any questions is quite a good place to start certainly a lot of the time um, assistants will go to me oh what about the sin bin and I'll go I've forgotten that for the 10th week in a row so it's always (laughs) good for someone to interrupt you and uh um, just make sure that you've covered everything that they wanted to cover as well. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, same sort of thing. They ask any questions. Usually, it's about foul throws. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so get a, like the nitty gritty stuff, and then I say, um, all right, plenty of eye contact, plenty of thumbs up, plenty of smiles, and we'll go out and smash it. Yeah, and that's brilliant. That's how I leave it. So that's great. I, I I think the main thing is, and this would be my feedback to everyone is. You're talking about the serious stuff about the game and then just making sure and reminding everyone why the hell we're there and yeah. the reason is to enjoy it, right? Like, that's the reason we go out and, and referee. Um, so, brilliant. Guys, really appreciate your time during this uh, lockdown. Um, and, and love to get you on in the future. I think everyone listening or watching, I hope you've taken some ideas around what a pre-match talk should kind of construct, you know, have part... What, how a pre-match talk should come together. Um, the key thing here is, you know, all of us are kind of grassroots, amateur, semi-professional level football in terms of refereeing. We don't have VAR. We don't have fourth officials in most of our games. So a lot of that, a lot of those people listening, I hope that resonates with you in terms of what we talk about. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to, you know, tweet us about any particular thing. If you've got any ideas that you, you do that are different to what we've spoken about today, um, give us a shout and let us know and we can, we can talk about those in future, future um, podcasts. So, uh, Rob and Dan, thanks so much for, for joining us. I uh, hope when the season does kick off, you know, you, you, get, you get back out and have a great season. And, and Rob, good luck on that promotion for, uh, for this year. Fingers crossed for you. Um, thank you. Thanks for, thanks for joining. Take care. Cheers. Thank you.